and I'm uh, Pat Delaney. Um, and uh, I did one a little earlier this, uh, this spring. And uh, <clears throat> the second one's about uh, five of my preferred uh, multi-pitch rock climbs. And uh, they all have a little bit of a theme to them. Um, I'll, I'll explain a bit uh, why the climb is uh, one of my favorites. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a story on a few of them. If you folks have any questions, you could uh, type those up. And uh, my lovely assistant here, Tim Ritchie, will be uh, affording me the questions. Um, so first off, uh, they all have a bit of a theme is I don't really need to wear rock climbing shoes on any of them. And that's a big deal for me. Um, my feet are always kind of a little bit sore. Um, so I wear like a sort of like a, a hybrid um, approach boot, if you will, a technical shoe that I find I can climb up to like low 510s with them and, and I'm pretty happy, uh, keeps my feet happy. Now I'm going to try to share my screen. So brace yourself. First one up is, um, is Mother's Day Buttress. Oh, we got a bit of a, a glitch here. Uh, it's not hauling peak. Um, Bow Valley Provincial Park. This one is uh, Mother's Day Buttress and uh, it's in uh, Banff National Park um, right by the right by the entrance to the Banff town site. Um, it's on Cascade Mountain and uh, this is my buddy Roland Walters. Uh, we uh, we've had some uh, he's on this little presentation a couple times. We've had some good ones together. Um, <clears throat> uh, Timmy, how do I go to the next? Oh, thank you. Um, here's uh, the bulk of the climb on uh, on uh, Mother's Day. The Mother's Day is, is a classic. Um, the rock quality is quite good. There's a lot of ledges, so there's some loose rock. Um, an interesting story on this one, I, I actually failed my first go at the Apprentice Alpine exam, being examined by Mark Klassen. And, and Mark was trying to inst inst instill into me how, how important this route was to my career. And he was definitely right. I end up using it for a variety of purposes. Um, I can make it feel sort of pretty mellow following the line of 5'6", five, 5'4", five, and probably uh, moving up to about maybe 5'8", maybe even a little bit harder. Um, at pitch three here, you can kind of, you can see my cursor. I can, uh, I basically have explored all of this aspect just left of this yellow rock. Um, the reason why I like Mother's Day buttress um, is, as you can see here, um, I use it for a variety of different purposes. Um, here I can build, a, <clears throat> I get my guests to build a traditional anchor. In this case here, um, um, my friends Carly and Jason um, are, are following behind me and, and Carly's actually finished leading. So she's, she's actually being belayed from below and I'm belaying her from above. Her experience with leading was not very high on traditional gear. So here I'm kind of providing that supervision and that added security. Um, so I really like this route. Every single belay has an option of having a gear anchor or a bolted belay. So it's quite practical for me. Um, this is the start of the first pitch. Um, if you can see my cursor once again, the, the hiking trail typically follows a, a, a loose scree trail after a little bit of mandatory scrambling. Um, I tend to gravitate to the climber's left, right against the gully. I short rope, uh, meaning I move with my, my guests or my students um, and uh, coaching them through um, steeper rock, firm rock versus walking on the scree. And that really improves the experience and, and uh, reduces a little bit of a uh, user fatigue. And, and here I'm with a party of three on this particular day. So there was some coaching, some peer guiding and uh, some instruction throughout the day. Top of the pitch one, obviously ha helmets are really important. I have seen people without helmets on this route and something that I simply would not advise, even though the rock quality, as you can see the nice gray stone, nice and stippled locations, it's plagued with ledges. Um, so therefore lots of loose rocks. You have to be tuned in. It's not a route that you wanna be doing 
if you're thinking that you might not get to the top of the actual climbing, it's not a good route to repel. As you can see, some of that loose stuff here. Here we're kind of like nearing nearing the top on on um, on the route, and uh, there's some bolts involved in on the climb. Uh, various people have added bolts at times, and there's been a few bolt wars on it as well. It's a good route, really fun. Um, views of Minnewanka, as you get close to the top, I've never really been at the top without any real wind. Um, the valley that faces west heading towards Norquay and the exit to Sunshine, the winds really kind of pipe in through there and kind of tend to reach you on, on Mother's Day um, every single time. So uh, here the guest was wearing a Gore-Tex jacket, probably not really necessary, but um, did provide some good shelter for her, I guess. Again, the views, amazing views of the Bow Valley. Um, you, it's not too noisy because of the highway. We're, we are quite high up um, and uh, it doesn't seem, the highway doesn't seem to really deter from the views that we get. You can see how the glaciers and, and how the river kind of carved up um, the Bow Valley and you can see the hoodoos on either side of the highway. Uh, great views of Rundle and this was uh, probably my wild guess here is late in September um, with some new snow. Um, this is not a spring shot, a late season. Good times. Um, after we've kind of like short roped around and I'll demonstrate, I'll show a little bit later on that last slide, um, some of the walking you do. This is a bit of a circuit climb. Here we're on the descent and, and there's a, I've used a, some fixed line approach. So I like the route because it, it uh, offers me also uh, opportunities to practice my own craft, um, depending on the number of guests I have. Here having three guests you know, required some added management and times. And uh, here I've just set up some repels for them. Always keep a carabiner if you have to knot a system and it's not anchored anywhere. And they're providing a fireman's belay here. So it's a good little route, a little bit of everything. This is the only repel you should be doing on the route if you've completed the line. And um, here is the uh, line of Mother's Day. And uh, following my cursor, you kind of hike up into the trees and then circumnavigate these bowls. And you end up descending after passing over Cascade, the waterfall. Um, you descend and the rappel is somewhere here. You descend close to Rogan's Gully, which is the furthest left gully. The furthest right gully is Ursus Hole, where the largest avalanches come down every season, multiple times a, a season. As far as gear on a route like that, um, typically speaking, I'll, I'll select a 60 meter rope. Um, at times, you know, you, you're going to stretch it out, um, especially leading to the top where the climbing becomes a bit more straightforward, meaning like uh, there's fewer ledges, you can kind of stretch it out. And it also gives me options if I want to escape right as I showed earlier and uh, do some more challenging climbing, which I can assess by the performance of my guests in the first few pitches and see what their interest is and if I, if I need to like ramp it up a little bit. I took this picture yesterday. Second route is uh, um, really high up on my list and one of the classics of the 50 classics of North America is the Northeast Ridge of Bugaboo Spire. Um, I just absolutely love this climb. I love the fact that it's a huge route um, I, 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 I pick these routes because I love moving and I really enjoy a summit. So Mother's Day has a small summit to it. Um, and when we're walking around, we can kind of see that there's more options for future endeavors. You're kind of looking up into Cascade. Here it's like the summit is very pronounced. It's a very, um, how do you say, prominent peak. Um, this is the, the, the rough line. And uh, again, I love it because I don't really have to wear climbing shoes and it's a great experience for my guests. They really love this route. Um, here's the rough line. You, so we approach from the hut and um, this is kind of all part of the scrambling, if you will. 
here I just pitch it out, but most recreationalists here, some most folks won't rope up, typically speaking, as I can kind of see. Um, some do. And uh, the first kind of two pitches uh, or three pitches bring you to this spot here. And for me, this is the guiding crux of the day these days from this ledge system, uh, because there tends to be a lot of people on the route. And uh, every single time I've climbed it in the last probably, I don't know, five or six times, there's a lot of people. And um, I tend to um, guide more than one guest on this route. Um, my standard is two guests. It's kind of very rare that I guide one guest on the route. Um, that's my personal choice. It doesn't seem to slow me down. And I, and I enjoy uh, the challenge of guiding two when I descend the cane route. Um, so yeah, it's a great day. I really enjoy it. It takes me about, uh, on average, fastest time was seven hours hut to the, um, to the uh, south summit. And uh, the longest day I've had on this thing was uh, about 12 hours sort of um, hut to hut. Uh, this is on the approach as we're kind of approaching the hut. Those who've never been to the bugaboos, um, it's just a, it's, it's a really worthy trip. Um, beautiful, awesome flowers. Sometimes you're, you're, you're lucky enough to see some, wild, some, some wildlife. I haven't seen a bear um, yet in all my, my trips into the bugaboos, but I definitely think about it in this particular ab area. You can see the fireweed and you know, tall grass and avalanche slopes. It seems to be a, a place. I cannot always yodel and have never seen a bear stand up, but maybe one day. Um, and the Bugaboo's Lodge is right down here. Here's uh, James Blanche, aka Tumbleweed. I, I, I had a picture of James in here. I thought it was a good place. James is right in front of the hut at this stage. Um, and uh, some of my first experiences guiding in the Bugaboo's were with James. Um, and I just just uh, wanted to have a picture of him here. Here's a little caption of the hut with uh, part of the snow patch in the background. Um, and this particular window, is, if you're staying at the Bugaboo's at uh, the Cane Hut, it's a really good place actually to sleep by the window. So if you come into the hut with your stuff, like drop your gear, go take a look upstairs, quickly go put your sleeping bag if there's no if there's nobody there, it's one of the nicer places, especially when the hut gets kind of warm. This is a this was a, a, a interesting morning. Um, this was a very rowdy day of guiding. Um, lots of people on the route. Um, this is my first guest kind of coming to me. The, the, he's trailing a rope. Uh, the red line here vaguely kind of describes the approach. This is a, the the approach slab. Um, that you typically tackle in the dark uh, these days. Uh, usually I'm leaving a hut by about 4.30, which is ex very early these days. Um, and then this is just a, a couple rope stretchers of really moderate climbing, like, you know, somewhere in the 5.4 or 5.2 range or even some fourth class stuff, but I just pitch it out for speed. A uh, little story about the this particular day. So on this day, there was 30 people behind me, including one more guided party uh, that ended up uh, being bottlenecked and had to turn around. Um, as I kind of came up around the noon attack from the hut and approaching the base of this red line, uh, headlamps started turning on and people were kind of confused as to where the start of the route is and or was. And I, I heard someone say, He's a guide. <laughs> and uh, so I, as I kind of dove into the Bergschrun and, and started climbing, I was a bit flustered and moved really quickly. The, the rock was, uh, is a little bit gritty there in the morning and, and you gotta be careful. And I did one of these things where I just told my clients, when you get a chance, put me on belay. Um, it's something that I don't tend to do anymore at all. Um, it's uh, not really necessary, but there I really felt the pressure. And uh, as I got up to uh, this little nook here, the change in the angle, I, um, I wrapped my rope around a horn and I had a second rope to my client. It's a lot of rope to manage on this feature, uh, but you have two guests and I don't really want them to be climbing underneath each other. 
And then someone started batmaning my rope, meaning they were pulling on the rope hand over hand, pulling directly on my harness. And uh, I was immediately taken back and grabbed the other end of the rope that I had looped around the horn and held on tight and, and looked behind me and so a young man was pulling on my rope. So un not being clear as to what his situation was, I, I just kind of invited him to keep doing what he was doing. I was, I was quite irritated. Anybody who knows me well knows what that really means. And uh, as he kind of got close to me, I, I instructed him to kind of take the horn beside me. And when he was all anchored in, I, uh, I expressed my opinion and uh, my sentiments to him there. And we never saw them again for the rest of the day. But yeah, this is uh, topping out the second pitch. Um, I'm blowing off a massive horn. It's really cool uh, and beautiful morning light. So anyways, Bugaboo's really busy. And on that day, I passed past six people that were still going down from the day before. So that's three parties. This is higher up, kind of like uh, after I've done the first three pitches, uh, which I typically take my time. So on that particular morning, um, you know, somewhere at the base here, I, um, I, I remembered a story of a colleague of mine that took an unfortunate fall um, just after this picture, I guess, on the third pitch. And he was pressed by other parties as well. So I kind of cracked a joke and I asked them if they could kind of give this old boy, like, you know, the first two pitches. And after that, if they wanted to kind of uh, pass me, they, I, would, I would make room. And, uh, but secretly knowing that I'd never see them again. Um, and here, as I turn the corner, I basically open it up and I just climb as quickly as I possibly can to alleviate the pressure on my guests so they can enjoy themselves, um, take their time climbing this stuff. It's not particularly difficult. Maybe it feels about 5'8"-ish um, overall. And uh, in, these, in these chimneys, uh, the climbing is 5'4", five, 5'6". Five, I'm unclear. It's it's pretty positive granite climbing with short little cruxes. Um, this is on another day, but um, topping out the chimneys, um, I'm starting to approach the um, the north summit here, which is just here on the background, making my way to the first short rappel. Very exposed at the top. Um, I don't really use much short pitching, uh, more short roping on uh, Bugaboo Spire. Um, I find it just kind of too exposed and um, uh, I rather short pitch it. It seems to work better for me. I, I'm quite comfortable and enjoy short roping a lot. I just find on this particular feature, I, I pitch it out and short pitch it, meaning I make short pitches literally. So maybe 10 meters or something like that. In some cases, I stretch out a large portion of the rope putting protection on, especially with one guest. Here's uh, approaching the Ocheval section. I protect with like rock gear. And this is the little rappel on the background. On this particular day, uh, maybe uh, 40 minutes later after this picture was taken, a party kind of topped out here and we were on the South Summit. And, and there was the first party and I was kind of, oh God, they're coming. They're, they're pressing behind me. And then I watched a young man throw 140 meters of rope off to do a 10 meter rappel, which gave us a little bit more time for lunch. And we could relax a little bit as they were managing the tanglements in their ropes. And from the South Summit, you can see um, the Hauser Towers in the background here, a really cool ridge that uh, if any of you are, are interested in, in uh, being guided by me, there's a, an unclimbed section of this ridge here that I've been really wanting to, to do. I think it would probably go um, just as is. Um, it looks pretty good. The, the, the glacier has been, has been uh, uh, melting and receding and, and moving in such a way that it, it, it's becoming more um, uh, reasonable to approach it. And uh, so I keep my eye on this thing and I'd be really keen on someone wanting to go and take a look and take a try and, and try to get this thing. It'd be really cool. It'd be a big couple days probably. Here we've started sending the south, um, this, this, from the south summit here. Um, and here's a bit of beta. So most people end up repelling to the left of where these climbers are. 
Uh, there's three climbers here. One of the climbers has come in from the typical um, approach the south summit. So there's a spot on the uh, on the ridge uh, as you're doing the ridge here on the northeast ridge that you can rappel down into this notch. Um, I avoided by doing some sort of 510 maneuvers, um, a bit exposed, maybe a, a harder than 10 plus sort of thing for a move. And I, I, I usually leave a couple of daisy chain and um, atriers in place for so my guests if they they're not as as comfortable climbing that difficulty. Um, that they can pull through and and uh, so I keep my line, my rope line onto this face and I rappel to the station versus rappelling down here and pulling my ropes and walking into the into the the rubble here. I typically rappel to this station and then lower my guests one at a time to this to the pre, to the station that it's called the gendarme rappel. And uh, in this case here, I went down first because there was already a party there. Uh, as mentioned before, um, there was there was uh, six people um, that we ended up um, passing on the way down. So yeah, Bugaboo Spire. Um, in terms of gear, uh, I carry 60 meter ropes. I carry a double rack of cams um, to uh, the number three and uh, a 0.4 Camelot. I carry nuts with me, but I never use them on the route. Um, I put them in my pack in case I had to repel. And I carry four extendable slings, um, so 60 centimeter slings and uh, two uh, 120 centimeter slings I can also use for runners. I don't typically clip quick draws to my cams um, on cracks. Um, they might not be good for the duration of my pitch, but for the duration that I need them, um, they're really good. And because uh, they could move without uh, runners on them. And uh, uh, I keep the runners for the essential pieces of gear where it's, they have to, they, they hold a specific responsibility of, of holding the gear in place as directionals for my guests. And those will get uh, one of the four, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, runners that I do carry. So I try to keep my, my load as, as low as possible. And I do carry a pair of climbing shoes just in case things get wet or I have to get creative. And they're like my backup something. They live inside my pack. They allow me to climb a couple grades harder. The next one is um, Eisenhower Tower on, on uh, in Banff National Park in Castle Junction. Um, I absolutely love this climb. I think it's really cool. It's a long approach, um, but I really love the position and uh, it's a really worthy objective. It also tends to be in, a, in a, an interesting rain shadow where if the weather is really bad in Lake Louise and sometimes bad in, Cat in Banff, I tend to get away with things here. Sometimes the tarp comes out a few times. The rock is dolomite and uh, quite high friction. And uh, so yeah, you're, you can climb it even after a light rain and uh, no big deal, it's, it's quite good. One thing to consider though on this route is thunder and lightning. So as you're kind of getting into July, if you really wanna start thinking about it if you've got these convective systems. The good thing about this peak is I can see the storms coming. Um, not the same on some routes um, like uh, Mount Louis, I, I might not have the opportunity to see stuff coming at me. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is kind of the rough route here. This is after the approach. We're looking at uh, um, getting on to the, to the goat plateau. So there's a bit of a, a traverse here on a good ledge. And I tend to short rope this entire thing. So meaning like I'm not pitching out anything whatsoever traditional form. The gear is like holstered inside the pack. Um, I don't have a whole bunch of GAC on me. I just have some coils in my hand. Usually about four coils is good for one person. And I just kind of work my way onto the onto the goat plateau. And here's rolling again. This was a really cool day for us. I don't know if I can kind of see them just yet, but there's a guides exam out there. And that was extra incentive for a rolling and I that wanted this day we kind of wanted, uh, we want to give her and uh, it took us, uh, I think six hours from the car to the summit. 
which was pretty quick. And we weren't run, running, but we were having a, a nice uh, stiff pace. Uh, Roland likes a good workout, and so do I. Oh yeah, here's the party right here. You can see them. I won't name them, but uh, I was yodeling and they could hear me coming. And uh, the examiner was encouraging my speed, if you will, um, using it as a demonstration of what we can do. So anyways, the route kind of comes up onto the dragon's back here, lots of short roping, making its way here. And then this is the Eisenhower Tower proper. Um, this is the descent line. Um, some folks choose to climb this. I would not recommend it. It's not a good, it's not a good route at all. Um, but uh, some folks choose to do it. Um, I have done it um, in uh, wintry conditions, and that's pretty cool to go up in this aspect. The route climbs the right-hand side here, uh, following this uh, a right trending line on very good dolomite. Um, there is loose rock, and you've got to be aware of that. Um, on this route, I carry uh, typically uh, five cams, um, purple Camelot to number three, and I carry uh, four runners and two long runners, and, and that usually serves me well. Um, uh, an interesting story on my on my ill-fated first Alpine Guides exam, I I was guided by I was being led by Rudy Cranabitter on this thing, and at the car park, he said to me, um, in the morning, he could hear my gear. And he's just like, what's this clinging and clanging all about? And he's like, I thought you were some hot climber from the coast. Now this is 5'4", you don't need gear. So I just carried slings and locking carabiners and uh, basically soloing the whole route with Rudy in tow, unroped he was. And at one point I was trying to find a station, you know, and, and he's like, ah, a little bit of a challenging ledge, huh? He's like, I bet you'd like to have some of that clinging and clanging now. So I didn't have any rock gear, but I had slings and I made it work. But uh, those were different times and different exams, but uh, good times. Here's uh, <clears throat> my friend Tina coming up here. Um, you can see the dragons back in the background. Once you get at this spot here, it's quite flat, really nice. And here's the, the, the famous notch with the... Uh, uh, V254 maneuver. It's uh, it's far from 5.4. It's probably like, it's a move of 5.9 probably. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, really cool route. I like going fast on it. Um, I like covering lots of terrain with, with folks. And this is one of these perfect routes to do it. Rolling at the summit. Really psyched. Probably laughing at the candidates and the examiner. <clears throat> we had a good one and great views obviously eh? like you can see temple in the background and the clouds rolling in in the afternoon but we're already on our way down as far as for gear for eisenhower tower i carry a 40 meter rope so i carry two 40 meter ropes and that allows me to link up the rappels properly with a single 60 meter rope um, you cannot link up station to station. You come short on several um, several repels. And um, I'm not really sure what the plan was there with the bolting, but uh, the ledges make sense. And a 40 meter rope seems to work perfectly. I've never had to stretch it out much longer than that. On the times that I do guide it with a single 60, um, I, I go faster on the ascent, but kind of like a slow down on the descent. So what I typically do is carry a single 40 meter um, single rope, uh, meaning it's rated for uh, a single climber. And I have a lightweight about seven millimeter half rope that's 40 meters that lives in the bottom of my pack. I don't make my guests carry the rope. I carry the rope myself. And when I do approach, I usually approach with running shoes, like comfortable running shoes. And I stash them at a junction, and then I put on my little approach boots. Um, they're just not pleasurable to walk with when you're working every day, um, especially when you're coming down. The soles of my feet just tend to be in pain. And uh, so I just wear really comfortable shoes. I think the guys at Ski Uphill call them uh, 
recovery shoes or something like that. They're really cushiony and soft. The next one is Hauling Peak. Why not? It's right. It's prominent peak once again. Another of my uh, choices that has another summit. A lot of uh, my preferred routes have summits. That's what I do. I, I bring people up into the mountains and we top out stuff. And uh, the northeast face of Hauling. Um, really cool. Right above Canmore. Um, yeah. Super fun route, you know, top out, and uh, another route that unfortunately you do not see the western sky. So you're gonna have to be careful, making sure you have a really nice day of weather. Um, it's happened a few times where you're kind of topping out, and as you top out, there's a sign there that points to the hiking trail, and uh, it has had some ringing, if you will, from uh, static electricity a few times. So. I never tend to lollygag on this route on days or imperfect weather. Here's the approach. Um, so you basically park at White Man's Gap by, by the reservoir there and you approach as per grassy lakes. And instead of descending, you follow the, uh, the pathway and then and make your way towards the top of uh, uh, Riders of Rohan, a good mountain bike trail. It used to be a horse packing trail and uh, then switch back. Um, this section is miserable, <laughs> but you face it really slow and, and then you get below the wall um, and then just basically traverse and then straight up. And uh, yeah, super fun. There's a variation that I also bolted it straight up from the, uh, from the call proper um, that adds a few pitches of good climbing uh, but doesn't speed up the route at all. I usually take that if there's people um, on the climb. So this is the usual approach. So if there's people here, there's a lot of loose rocks. So I come popping out of this zone here and then gain this line. Here's a little bit higher up on the route. But again, the topic of seeing a lot of the loose rock in the Canadian Rockies, always a consideration to be climbing underneath other parties. Um, same story here. I use this route for a variety of things. Um, here, there's some literal leading. Um, so my guests are, are taking the lead after I've taken the pitch. So typically I take the pitch, um, maybe even pull the rope and uh, leave a few pieces of gear in place. Sometimes I maintain the belay. In this case here, these two are quite experienced and um, good climbers. And uh, uh, they're doing their own gig here and being supervised and getting some coaching. And of course, we're using ropes of different color in case we'd have to bail from the route. Super good position. This is some of the nicest climbing on the route. Uh, big prominent corner you see from town. Uh, you can see some of the uh, walking trails, a reservoir, really cool aspect. Love this, love this climb. And I really enjoy topping out uh, and, and seeing the hikers are always kind of amazed as you top out there and, and uh, it's a cool experience for everyone. Next up, it wouldn't be uh, appropriate to have uh, on there uh, anything else, but uh, Mount Louis is one of these five. Um, a mega classic in the Banff area, surprising that the route, the peak doesn't make it into the 50 classics. Um, in specific here, I have the cane route, but there's a variety of options that I have guided and do guide on a routine basis. There's the uh, um, uh, Brandon Pullins route here. I forgot the name. Sorry about that, Brando. Um, super high quality. I just wish you had some stations, bro. Awkward to get some anchors and spots. Um, it kind of ramps up the cane route to a 510 level, but very high quality. Uh, I would start just right at the Moser route. Otherwise, I have to go and gain some of uh, this aspect to do some short roping to gain the main ridge here. Um, good perspective on, on some of the options here. This is the, the Moser route that kind of like comes up and then climbs the left-hand side of this feature. So this is the short roping bit. So there's some pitches in here and I kind of start short roping somewhere around here, a little few pitches. This is all short roping. This is the normal rappel into the gully. Um, I keep looking right, and there's another option that takes you to a higher station. And a short rappel 
L, about 25 meters, um, takes you to a, a, an awkward little stance. You can build a gear anchor. And then I wrap around, pitching it out, climbing into the cane route. And that will shave off roughly about 40 minutes off of my day, um, alleviating a little bit of pressure again on my guests and then avoiding some of the exposure to rock fall over here. Um, I know of a, at least one other guy that Greg Golovach mentioned this anchor once to me. I know he uses it. I suspect our class and uses it, but it's not a frequently used anchor and uh, yet much safer position to be than being in this gully. Um, so yeah, anyways, kind of the deal. And a diamond face with all the cool classics now on that thing, hard classics. Um, here we can see like the, um, <clears throat> the, this is the rappel to the cane. And this, I believe is my rappel kind of here to this ledge. And then I pitch it out and join the root into here. And the classic Perrin finish. Um, Kane used this chimney that he actually down climbed. So when Conrad Kane first climbed the cane route, he did not use a rope, which is totally mind boggling, um, but impressive. And uh, to be doing that uh, while working is, is really pretty, pretty amazing to me. Um, it's a, it's a really nice route to, to, to be on the rock quality. Once you kind of reach this spot here. Um, so this is the upper climbing here. It's, it's really good stone. It's not quite stippled, very nice stone. I wonder if it's part of the Palliser group. I'm not clear on that. And then it takes you all the way into the parent crack, which gets you to the summit. Um, there's always more pitches than you think. And at the summit here, I usually transfer into short roping mode to get myself to the rappels. And then a series of bolted rappels take you down some gullies and eventually to uh, a big old scree field. And when you get to the summit, you'll know there's a Calgary Mountain Club um, cross there. Uh, the same cross that got hit by lightning on the day that uh, Fred Becky was up there with some young guys from Banff and one young man, a bit of a shock and was passed out. And, and Mr. Becky was trying to convince the other two to just leave him that he was probably dead. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of it for my, for my roots. Um, here's a picture of uh, Mount Victoria, not really um, uh, a multi-pitch rock climb, but uh, a really beautiful location. And this summer, uh, I'd love to get back up there, but it would take someone willing to kind of um, have a really big day. We can't really use the Abbott hut anymore. And, um, and uh, uh, so it's a pretty big day getting up there, but really beautiful ridge system. And uh, if anyone wants to kind of go and do this thing, you have cell phone reception at the top. And this is me probably taking some more work from Yamniska. Um, as far as the cane route on Mount Louis, um, as far as gear, I carry um, a bit a single rack from uh, uh, Purple Camelot to number three. I carry six draws, so two short sport draws and four runners. And uh, um, I tend to use the runners on occasion. It depends, um, but I definitely use them on the parent crack now uh, where there's fewer pitons than before, a few bolts here and there. And uh, six runners tends to be more than enough for me with some gear. Uh, training tips for first bugaboo trip. So a good question. Uh, thanks to whoever asked that question. Training tips for the bug for the bugaboos. Well, one, if you've not climbed granite cracks before, try to get some crack climbing. It really gives you some options. Um, hiking, you know, get a lightweight pair of boots um, that would fit in the backpack and um, really well, a small backpack not too stiff. So if you show up a pair of Nepal Top Extremes, it really makes your approach a bit rugged and you have some really rugged boots to carry around on your roots. As far as training, it is a kind of a big hike in. I, I, you know, it takes a 
three to four and a half hours. It depends. I mean, the fastest is about two and a half hours, I think, hut, uh, car to hut. And that's hoofing it. I can't recall how much vertical meters. I think it's about 700 meters or something like that from the car park to the hut. Um, so practicing or, or training with a heavy backpack, to be honest, going uphill. Um, if you're training running and you're doing so at low RPMs, um, you know, running on the flats, it's not really useful. Um, you're best off to kind of like, you know, if you're around the Canmore area, I'd suspect putting like, you know, 25 to 30 pounds in a backpack and going up Rundle or hauling a couple times a week could be a good way of going about it. Um, the bugaboos tend to have heavy backpacks because of the gear. Uh, we can't stash anything there anymore. Um, this summer, you'd have to be carrying your share of camping equipment. We can't stay at the hut. Um, I've stayed at Applebee several times. It's really nice. Um, but you should expect a backpack of about 70 pounds. And I'm unclear at this stage if we have access to porters or not. We do have access to porters. So fantastic. So that means take the porters. So if you have an option, if you're going to be guided up this thing, um, hire the porters. I mean, they're going to make your load a lot easier. Going in there recreationally, if I'm going in there for several days, I'll probably fork out and carry a, hire a porter myself. Um, I don't really like carrying a 90, 90 pound pack anymore. It's not really part of uh, what I like, um, but I can do it. So if that's any um, advice for training, you know, crack climbing and carrying a heavy backpack. Any other questions? We're pretty good with that. So anyways, those are my five sort of like guiding routes. Um, and uh, as far as the, the climbing shoe store, think about it, try it out once in a while. I try to get my guests at times to, to try it and you'll be surprised what you can climb with sticky rubber on your approach shoes. And uh, you don't really have to jam your feet into climbing shoes absolutely all the time. Uh, Conrad Kane, when he did the cane route, he had uh, hobnail boots and climbed the crux in wool socks. And that's the truth. So anyways, thanks for tuning in. And uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. If, if you have any questions or you're interested in some guiding, uh, you can reach me through Yamniska Mountain Adventures. And uh, this weekend I'm teaching a multi-pitch course and I think there's room for one more. So uh, it should be fun. And we better with a group of four than a group of three, but I'm keen. So give us a ring. Cheers, thanks a bunch.